Oh, how fabulous. Hi, welcome to How Fabulous by Tony and Co. I'm Tony, and in today's episode, we speak to the very fabulous Steve Kearney. Now, Steve is a Melbourne-based um, TV and film producer, um, and we met many, many, many years ago, um, actually through his wife. I had her in for a casting when I was a casting consultant, and then over the years, skip forward, we've connected another way. Now he's a lovely man, a very unassuming man, and you think, oh, big, you know, Hollywood producer. He's totally unlike that at all. But he has been responsible for um, a couple of wonderful movies, Bad Girls, um, Bad Girl rather, starring Samara Weaving, and also one of my favourite movies, Oddball, starring Shane Jacobson. So there's that. But outside of that, we talk about his life as um, an actor, an entertainer, how he got into the business, the sort of flipped back and forward from LA to Melbourne. And he's just quite fascinating. So there's that. So I really do hope you enjoy this episode as much as I enjoyed connecting with Steve and, um, and hearing his story. Hello, and welcome to How Fabulous by Tony & Co. I'm Tony. And today I am joined by the very, very fabulous Steve Kearney. <laughs> and he's looking and smiling, and he is very fabulous. Um, welcome, Steve. Am I co? You're Tony and I'm co? Yes, you can be co today if you'd like. Okay. That's all right. I'm co. Mm. So, Steve Kearney, we met quite a few years ago now because we were just discussing that your one of your boys is in fact like 20. 20. Sorry, I beg your pardon, 22. 22. 22. That's very old. And I feel <laughs> like I remember him when he was like little yeah. and small. So it would have been 11 years ago. That's when I first met you and Lulu. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it just, it's that, yeah. that last time just went and then gone. That's how it is. Like, like last year. Yeah, that was, a, that was. An I kept missing out on a everything. year going dates. But like, oh, Jesus. I'm yeah. And now you've got to go 21. One, 21. 21. Yeah. Mm. But, and, you know, yeah. I think the lockdown secured our sons moving out. Oh. Uh, like, okay, we have enough of dad jokes. <laughs> <laughs> heard that one. Hey, did you? Yeah, I heard that. Yeah. I know that already, dad. That's not, yeah. I'm not laughing anymore. And yeah, so, I don't have any stories because I've been bringing you up. Oh. I don't want my son, we were talking about this. I don't want my son to move out. But I mm. do understand that it is natural. It's a natural process it's and it happen. has to happen. Mm. It's like pooing. There's that. So it's exactly like pooing. Mm. You, you're actually like, you know, getting rid of your children. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> just like, like that. Just, mm. But anyway, so there's that. So we've known you for a very long time. And although we sort of don't move in the same social circles, mm. um, I've kept uh, across what you've kind of been doing and what Lulu does because, of course, you've got the the dance studio, mm -hmm. the glittery tapping Wonderland. Wonderland. The Wonderland. Yes, that's what we do. Uh, that's what you do. It's fabulous. And so, Lulu, your wife, which I hope that Lulu will come on one day and chat as mm. well, um, she literally is the tapping lady. She's mm. the dancer. That's right. And so you've had these businesses together for a long time as well. Um, and I just remember her walking around and just being fabulous and me thinking, oh, she mm. just probably just dresses up all the time, wears she red does. lipstick <laughs> and just taps around. And she's, she's taken to putting lipstick on down the beach. Oh, I love it. She's my you know, kind of girl. And maintaining it. Good. I love that. I she, love that she's she doing that. She says people look at her a lot better. Yeah, well, I think there's that. I mean, I'm mad for a lipstick, always. Mm. And I think as we get older, we just go, oh, fuck it, we're just going to wear yeah. it. I'm just going to just slap that yeah. on and just wear it. You know, you get invisible as you get older. Does a man get invisible as yeah, he gets older, sure. though? Really? That's interesting. Tell me more about that. Because I thought it was a, was a chicken we bad all thing. We <laughs> from, from the people we want to notice us. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, I always noticed you guys around. And in fact, I remember mm. trying to cast you both in an advertising campaign I yeah. was producing for 
I'm going to say it, Crown. Mm. And they sent me back the the feedback of it. <laughs> what was it? What was the feedback? Okay, so the, the feedback for all the talent that I put through, um, that you were too handsome and she was too pretty. And I went, mm. I don't understand what you've brief is there what damn. damn so that's kind of nice so yeah. no you didn't get the job yeah. but you know it was just a an advertising gig but that's nice feedback so now you know now i know that that's how it was too handsome and too pretty and i went i don't understand what you want but anyway and w was i too pretty or too handsome? you were too pretty and and lula yeah. was too handsome handsome she has got a handsome face she has got a really handsome face mm. she's really handsome and I have Anyways, and then so as well, so through school we met. Yeah. And I remember one of the first times I actually laid eyes on you when we first started at the school was you had a microphone in your hand and you were emceeing <laughs> at one of the school functions. Functions. And you were, I mean, you know, you were really playing crowd and, and, and I thought, oh, that's unusual for a school thing going <laughs> on. What's? Then I found out that actually, in fact, you are an actor, performer, entertainer, and producer, and mm. we'll go into that because that's a very fascinating um, mix of mm. um, things to do. Um, and 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 then I thought, oh my God, what's he just doing in the yeah. burbs with us, commoners? <laughs> You know. I'm in the witness protection program for comedians. Oh my god. Right. And and so how did you start off? Like what like so how what so we'll come we'll go back to, we'll yeah. come back to what you do now, but you started off as a an entertainer, a part of a comedy duo called Los Trios Rimbacos. Yes. Correct? Yeah, well we were at um, I was at college. Opposite Monash Uni, there was a place called Rusden, and it was a, um, a teacher's college, but it had a big drama department, media department, so everybody went there to, and we're during the Whitlam years, so it was all free. Oh, Everything. Da, 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 da. You'd just go to the camera and go, Give me the, can I have a camera and five, four hundred foot rolls of film, please? They go, there you go. Really? You go off and make a movie, pr process as many photos as you like, and put on plays, and it was just... You Were know, you in was, heaven? Did you just go, this is, this is for I me? I was in heaven. Yeah, and, um, yeah, yeah. And now? And we would do uh, all sorts of events at all times of the day, just for fun. And, um, yeah, the, the, the other guy who was in the Los Trios, Neil, I saw him do some weird stuff and a dance. It was, he was just in the, the, the gym. And there was a poster up, come to the gym. And I was the only one there. <laughs> <laughs> he was sitting in a chair and someone was dancing around tying him up with you know lace or something and I went he looked like Lincoln you know yeah, sitting right, there right, right, and right. I'm like oh I should uh, work with that guy and um so how old are you so you're like 20 oh uh, this was 18 so 18 okay 19 yeah, yeah. yeah and um yeah maybe maybe 19 20 yeah um yeah we just did a little show at, at lunchtime and uh I, he just got on a piano accordion and I had a little drum drum set and we'd, we'd just do st stupid songs. And so it was all just improv kind of stuff? Yeah, just and we found out whatever. we had a timing and when mm. we did the timing people laughed and suddenly you've got a crowd around you and and you go, oh, well, gee, we, we should do that again next time and so that starts to build a little routine. So it was physical, physical comedy? Yeah. Mm expressing well so, yeah it was kind of weird weird comedy and uh then we went over to monash and we do concerts just busk in the not not even busk just annoy people with our entertaining yeah and um uh, eventually we, we found out about fitzroy and comedy clubs and uh you just keep building material more material out of we would out of, of your imagination yeah write it during the day and then go out and try it at night and there was many many clubs to go to sometimes you know after a year or two we were doing five shows a night you know on the weekend we're doing up to seventy dollars uh, seventy dollars for yes. five <laughs> that's huge oh i'm telling you <laughs> we were smart businessmen yes and yes. um but yeah you could do that then and um uh, and, and a lot of the scene back then was 
physical comedy, people doing characters. Yeah. There really wasn't any stand-up. Yeah, right. Um, and was it singing as well? Were you singing or just, what, just talking? Oh, we do. Or um, we ended up doing uh, rock and roll parodies or, mm. you know, we had a big song. Uh, we, we do nihilistic uh, punk stuff. Our big song was We Fuck Babies in the Mouth. <gasps> so that was, um, oh, outrageous. Outrageous. What? It was, so that was your whole, that was your whole stick. It wasn't really it was just, that outrageous back then. Yeah, I think right. it'd be more outrageous now. Yeah, it'd be way more outrageous Because, you know. Yeah, you can't do that. It's evidently bad. Yes, to yes, do. yes. And so, so that all sort of, it started to gain momentum and you were, you know, getting around Melbourne and getting a little mm. bit of a name for yourself. Were you trying to work, you know, full time outside of that? Or was that, were you looking at that like it was your work? Well. That was your job. Yeah, well, I had a, I had um, some kind of premonition when I was twelve that I would be in uh, Los Angeles. I'd be making movies. <gasps> that happened. And I'd, I'd just about to make my movie, and the earthquake would hit, oh. and everyone would die. Oh. And. <laughs> oh. And this is what you were having so, a premonition so I had this, about at 12. This thing, I had to go to LA, but if I did and I was successful, I'd kill everybody. So that's why I failed. Yeah. To, to save planet Earth. Wow. A bit like Superman. Yeah. Oh my, so anyway, that's a lot to unpack there. That is a lot to unpack. My, my head's just gone. But I, I had this yeah, urge to, to get to New York or LA and, mm. um, you know, growing up. Jerry Lewis and Steve Martin was big and you're like that's where it's at yeah. um, because there was not much of that sort of scene for you to stay here in Australia even if you went to Sydney or you know well you could go we took we started touring and then you go Melbourne Sydney Melbourne Sydney Melbourne Sydney Adelaide Melbourne Sydney Melbourne Sydney, Adelaide and yeah. you're like uh, yeah. uh, maybe Perth here yeah and once you do that for yep. a year or two. You felt like you needed to spread your wings and just yeah. get out and get bigger, get a bigger audience and a different audience that sort mm. of um, maybe looked at what you were doing differently as well, you know, America well, we, being we, America. We got the opportunity to go to Edinburgh, mm. which I'd never heard about. Well, I thought it was the third year of the festival, so 1982. And um, through John Pinder, who ran The Last Laugh, was, was our manager at the time and great friend and dearly missed mm. and um, he just said you know you've got to go there and you've got to do this and uh, we'll we'll build suitcases which I've still got which fit in a London cab and you can tour you can do shows all around we're like okay okay and uh, it was just a wild wild ride we went to Edinburgh it, and um, um, it just so happens that uh, the people from the young ones were a lot of the judges that the year. The people from the young ones, just throw that in there, fucking love it. The pri prior, prior to that, the people from the young ones toured uh, Australia. Mm. Uh, and when they came to Melbourne, I put my hand up and said, I'll, I'll be their drummer in the backup band and I'll get to know them and it'll be funny. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so they got to know us who we were doing shows upstairs, they were downstairs and then we became you know, pretty good friends with some of them, and uh, you know, Rick and Rick, oh, Rick, and um, rest in peace, Rick, uh, Alexi, and all that. I'm not funny, I'm an alternative comedian, Alexi and uh, yeah. um, so yeah, by the time we got to Edinburgh, they happened to be there, we were like, oh, hi, and they like came to see our show because no one was coming to Edinburgh. No one was coming to see our show. Oh, to, you, to see your show. Okay, sure. We were coming out were, being the yeah. weird Aussies and mm, mm, mm. people were like, what the hell is this? And, you know, and there, was a, there was a door that led onto the laneway, which was never locked. So people would just walk in drunk, maybe vomit on the floor and walk out again in the middle of the show. Oh, wow. But anyway, the... Um, all part of character building all, and all character. thickening up your skin, uh, performing. Eventually word got around and, and, and with the help of... Um, of our British comedian friends, they we were up for this award, and uh, that's huge. And yeah, from that we we got a lot of offers to come back. We toured back there a lot. And we we ended up going to Edinburgh, you know, quite a few times. So was that that was 
obviously it must have been viable to oh god i'm stuck in my freaking here we go hold on um viable to actually just perform at a festival like i know it's edinburgh festival but you could sustain yourself were you dossing on people's couches did you set up a base there like how did you survive was it were you getting enough money to uh, know, well, we get, had get food um, or how does that work we had you know managers to do that we were just dumb comedians i don't know how that happened uh but we had a tour lined up so you get a regional tour so off the back of that you always kind of build something back in the day you do expos mm. so expos which fly you to canada and then you build another tour off that and um so even just having a manager mm. you know that's a huge thing people trying to get agents and managers i mean it doesn't just you don't just you, pay, you don't pay someone to do that they actually no. have to think you're good enough to do it oh yeah and that they can actually you know there's 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 traction and people mm. want to see it and they can sell you and they actually believe in your work so they you have must, to massively believe in you. Yeah, they have to massively believe in you. So yeah. you must have been, you know. Well, we did fabulous. a lot of shows at the Last Laugh, and, and mm. you know, John was, you know, a big fan, and he was the man, and took us there, and he came, and you know, was chalking the footpaths. He'd go off and write our names on the chalk, on the footpath, and write the time you're on, and oh, I love it. whatever desperate thing you had to do to yep. try and get a crowd. Which yeah, and you have to be fairly. Thick skinned, no Fuck doubt. Skinned. Thick skinned. Don't be thin skinned. Yeah, it's not like we got good reviews or anything. Um, but did you love the work you were doing then? Like you, oh, that sounds like a weird question, but you obviously believed in what you were doing. You thought mm. it was great. You know how sometimes. You, well, we you, knew it you, was great. Yeah, you knew it was great. Yeah. You you believed in it. You weren't just trying to churn out shit to make some money. You know, you actually really yeah. thought it was good and. Well, and yeah, I think we we're it. getting over a hundred dollars <gasps> a night that day. Hundy. Yeah. A we went from massive seventy hundy. to a hundy. And for, in Edinburgh, it wasn't really about the money back then. Well, it was about the craft and the work and the, you know. Where did the money go? Cre <laughs> To uh, the dance studio and to well, the, you your children, over, your children. You got to travel, you went overseas. <laughs> yeah, what a got, fantastic oh, time and meet the flipping young ones and the, yeah. you know, I mean, you probably have some wild, wild stories from back then, which you, you can, don't have to share all of them, mm. but your smile says it all, a little smirk. <laughs> uh, yeah. But living there, so mm. did you, so did you get around all of, um, did you go around Europe? Did you get to America? What happened after that? So yeah, we toured around. Um, we, we bought a van. Was it a combi van? What sort of combi van was van. it? Like no, like a, a British van. One of oh, those. Oh, one of those Bedford. Brit Bedford kind of, yeah, love it, love it, love it. And you tour around, and you then you get put up in people's houses and that sort of thing. Yeah. Right. Um, and we, we 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 did a little bit of Europe, and we did you know. A, we went to um, Amsterdam, and uh, you're doing a, a show um, where Beethoven played. And oh gosh, how fabulous! Uh, it's just, you know, yeah. as a young kid, it's just yeah, huge. It's the best. Yeah, it's the best. So you've and seen a lot of the world, right? And and we were away for a very long time though. We missed our mums. Yeah. And all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, and just, I guess, just missing. Australia's vibe. So by this stage, how old were you? Like mid twenties, or were you still? No, still early twenty. St still early twenties. Yeah, well, yeah, maybe twenty four or something. Twenty three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this is still in the eighties, and and so, so what else happened in America then? So somebody picked up this little act and wanted well, to well, do something with it. Well, after that tour, and we won Edinburgh, and um. And I won Edinburgh. Won Edinburgh. Yeah, so bad. Yeah. We got. Um, we went home via New York because I like I because oh. I like uh, we'll go home via New York. Yeah, got to see uh, New York. Um, this monogalist, quite famous, uh, Eric Bogosian, he uh, took took a shining to us, and he he was in Edinburgh, and he he said, "Come and uh, I'll find a place for you and and introduce you to New York scene." And, um, and so how did you meet him? Just by chance? Or? Oh, in Edinburgh, you know, in the bar. Yeah, yeah, he saw chat, the show. chat, chat. So it's show. all about you guys being there as well and having a chat and meeting that person. Yeah, it's and all then you meet that person. Meet in the bar. And it still happens now. <laughs> That's so right. Yeah. Mm. Well, we hope it happens. COVID. Yeah. 
Um, it all happens. It's happening all the time. It's happening all and Eric set us up, up in a you know an apartment down downtown, and uh, we 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 got a an offer from uh, a theatre to come back. I don't know a year later or something, which we did, um, and uh, you know it just kind of snowballed from there. When we did go back and we did shows, uh, it was kind of instant hit. And uh, you wait, someone calls me and goes, man, you should see it. It's, it's the front page of the New York Times. And they're like, I want, oh, you know, oh. the art section. And I'm like, oh God, there's a giant picture of me and Neil. <laughs> Have you still got the clippings of that? Oh yeah, I've got all those oh. clippings. I said, oh, I'll keep them on it. You know, now I am an old man. I go through my clippings. <laughs> I love it. Love and uh, getting really good reviews and meeting all these crazy people. Still getting billeted. <laughs> Still not enough money to hire get a hotel or anything. And also, we, we also weren't eating, but you know, it doesn't I matter. I don't think there was any eating going on. We were on. like, you know. Just don't be stupid. <laughs> um, and, and we're meeting, you know, Hollywood agents started knocking on the door. And, what is uh, the real world to be in? At, I mean, because you know, mid twenties is still so young. Mm. You know, from little old Australia, at that time, in the world, to be over in Hollywood mm. and meeting Hollywood people, just the thought of it would be quite scary. Or did you just have no fear and go, "Yep, sure, 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 just bring it on"? Pretty much bring it on. Yeah. Uh, we just knew we had a good, you know, great show mm. that, uh, you know, didn't work all the time. Mm. It was a very slight show. It was just made up of things that didn't go right. Mm. So if things didn't go, if things went right, it was not funny. <laughs> yeah. So it was, was it was a demanding show and physical and all that. But we had, um, we knew, you know, we're getting terrific reviews and um, meeting the, you know, the owners of these big agencies and. Yeah, we didn't realise how how big it was, really. You just, and then we we went to LA, and then you're meeting the head of the studio, and they're all lovey dovey and funny, and oh my and, and uh, we could just walk in and and do that. And it was, um, you know, we we went to LA and then just did a couple of shows for the agent, put on, and you get we got two three picture deals, one from Columbia Pictures, one from. Um, United. To make a feature film. That's six films. Dang. What about about the duo? Yeah. That's that's amazing. That's yeah. and what did you think about it at the time? I couldn't did you tell think? anyone because we didn't have mobile phones back then, so I could only call up my mum. Oh my god. Right. I don't think we got much press about it. Maybe we did, I don't know. Um, that's insane. And then we you know, they hooked us up with the writer of Pee Wee's Big Adventure. He was you. Yeah, and yeah. Steve Martin's longtime producer, and um, you know, Sid Gannis, who was the head of uh, Paramount at the time, he later became the head of Producers Guild. He's passed away, and mm. and he would bring um, Elvis Presley's wife, Priscilla, <gasps> to the shows, and this was all normal. Yeah, but I guess that's the thing because in in that kind of environment, it is. I mean. Every, there. It's, they you're there. That's, they have to live somewhere, and every second person mm. is a someone who's a someone, mm. and or someone trying to be someone, and you would just have to get really yeah. used to it real quick. Yeah, it's, but it's not as if, but we weren't making any money. You weren't making any money. No. So that sometimes happens, doesn't it, with these sorts of things? Yeah, so we do the, the shows the, the talent. for industry. We're, that's, mm. we're just doing industry shows. There's no money there. Mm. Um, and being told this is for your own good and it'll yeah. build your profile. And, and, and it came like to that. one point where the agent said, well, you can go back to being, you, can, you know, like everybody else, go and be a waiter for a little bit. Mm. Well, I'm like, I've never been a waiter. <laughs> I don't know how to wait. <laughs> I've never been broke until wait. I came to Hollywood. Yeah. And... Uh, so, so what did that prompt you to do? Like, what did you, what it happened? It prompts you to uh, get very, very tense. <gasps> mm. And, uh, you know, at various stages, you know, we were living off potatoes with Hollywood deals. Yeah. And, uh, you hear a lot of stories about that. You know, if someone weird, gets a yeah. great 
role in something or they're you know doing something fabulous that the regular normal people out in the world mm. go oh my god they're so famous and they're doing this and they're and you're like well you've just had a good had a movie out and you go we're still not making any money yeah. there's all these people we've got to pay we don't have any money yet yeah they, it's the perception it. yeah it's like this big yeah uh, no we it's got special. we we ended up with some deals and there's some money and then everybody jumps in, business managers, accountants, you know, lawyers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. PR and, people. Um, and yeah, and the, they take their chunk and then, you know, a few years later when it all disappeared, uh, you know, the, uh, the business manager calls up and says, well, you know, it's over. Come and get your things. <gasps> we oh. Get the le we're elevator up and we go there to the front desk and um, there's a little box of things of our tax returns not done <laughs> you know like fuck what was what was he doing then just i don't know getting fat off the well get rid of us before he has to do the tax returns oh my god that's terrible mm. i bet you that, i mean i'm sure that's happened that happens all the time you know to to well, to it's create a big industry people. that's a lot of people. i mean we weren't famous in america you know mm. we're, we're but, just, but big enough to be getting a six picture deal just in the within the industry yeah mm. we weren't i mean we get we eventually did get the green light on that movie so we ended up writing a movie with the peewees yeah uh, guy um michael barhol peewee's big adventure guy uh and they gave it a green light. The green and light. A green light. Mm. We were their secret weapon, they called us. And then that was on a Monday. And um, we, were we were here shooting Garbo by that time, which is an Australian, Australian film. film. And then by Friday, the head of the studio, this Sid Gannis, he was fired. And so everything that he wanted to do no. gets chucked away too. Oh, no. So your dream and there it just goes. gone. Boom. End. Yeah. How do you deal with that? I mean, what do you do? do, you, do you just talk about it forever and ever on every podcast you can find. Oh, God, that's just... It becomes that, one of the stories. It's so fascinating. But why do... Okay, so, so, so there was nothing you could do. You couldn't go over there and try and then um, convince somebody else of, to, to pick it up and well, by develop then, it that way. Well, we made a short film, a test short film mm. for Paramount. Over, they, there, or over there? Over there. Yeah, over there. And uh, they wanted to be non-union, which mm. they're not allowed to do. And so they, came, they, called, they had this company called Marimount. <laughs> what? <laughs> and they hit their trucks <laughs> behind the block. Oh, my God, that's And they that's shot so a short dodgy. film. And they spent $300,000 on it for 10 minutes of little. And that's what their proof was to get it. You know, we were terrific. And uh, so the cost of that project for someone else to buy just got up into half a million, six, seven hundred thousand dollars and people don't want to... Yeah, right. They don't want old news. They want new news. Oh, and t so, so disappointing. Yeah. And then, so what happened, you know, what did you do? Pick yourself up and go, no, nah, we're, we're out of LA. Well, we were this making Garbo shit. at the time, so we so just kept doing just that. Just here? Stay, stay, um, stay. And was it that in Melbourne or Sydney? Melbourne. Melbourne. Um... And uh, by that stage, you know, Neil, Neil and I decided to part at the end of that. Because that's he, a lot of stress. Well, we were in Australia for a very long time. It was like, well, what do we go back to, mm. you know? Mm. And um, we actually had a meeting in a, in a cafe on um, in Brunswick Street. And uh, when we got together and we, we were playing in the... In the foyer of uh of of the of the college rosen college we would mime to this record maria of mario lanza's tropical moon mm. this kind of goes a tropical moon <laughs> yeah and when we were there in the cafe exchanging well you get the piano accordion and i get the guitar amp okay and we sign a little dog on comes that song Oh. And you go, that's freaky. That's and then you move on. <laughs> and, then, and then that's it. And so that's do you it. still catch up with them now? Because you, you did have a reunion, but then that was the end yeah. of Los Trios. Pata. Well, we did a couple of weeks and, um, you know, that, I think that was it. We just went, oh, we, we can't really, you can't go back. Yeah. 
you know, his and little life you, I had a life. Yeah, and so by that stage, you did you have children by that stage? You, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you had yeah. so you had a family. So life mm. is different anyway because yeah. it just does change you having children, of course. And I'd nearly skewered myself with a chair. What? Well, I did, used to this routine as a young man. Uh, I had four plastic chairs, three plastic chairs, and I'd try to juggle them. They'd go everywhere. You know, real chairs, like school chairs. Yeah, yeah. And um, and I'd juggle them, and I, I'd throw them aside, and I'd do a big face plant onto the ground and get up and do that, and everyone's going, oh, oh. God, you must have been fit also. This is an aside. Yes. yes. And, and this one, uh, you know, me doing it as a... 45 year old whatever it's 50 year old could have been it's different um a chair landed in front of me and i went bang right <gasps> onto it and the leg was up and it just went into my skull there <sighs> instead of into my eye which it would have gone right through oh my god and i get up and uh and neil's gone uh oh and then the blood starts coming down oh no <laughs> And then uh, I start to feel woozy, and then Neil goes, "Okay, <gasps> sorry everybody, we're cancelling the show. Good night. Steve's going to hospital." Because of that on Steve's head, this, with the blood, with the blood, blood. and that red stuff, the and thing. And then he says, "That's it. Bye." But he's okay. used, he was used to it. That would, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you get hurt. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. And so, what did you decide that you were going to do with your life? Because now we find you producing and mm. writing and acting still. Mm. How did you? So you, you you said okay, that's the end of the physical comedy and entertainment. I'm going to be a producer. I'm going not, to write. Not yet, not yet. I went back to LA and. Oh, um, you did go back to LA. Yeah. Well, <gasps> I had an apartment there. Right, okay. So Neil had left his, you know, shut his apartment up. And so I had an apartment there and uh, somebody stole my guitar, which was a 63 Mustang. Oh, who Fender. does that? And um, the roommates had left and there were new people there and it was all weird and I'm like, oh wow, this is a terrific end to my <laughs> career. Um, but I kind of picked myself up and and made uh, a demo reel. Now, what, what did I do? Oh, yeah, I, I heard about this um, film called The Nutty Nut, which was um, being made by the Sam Raimi gang. Sam Raimi gang made these horror films. Uh, Sam Raimi went on to make Spider-Man and many other incredible stuff. Oh, just drop that in there. I'm just dropping that in Spider there. Man. Spider-Man. Spider-Man. Um, and it was, a, it was a role where you had to play multiple personalities. And uh, they wanted Jim Carrey to play it. He'd been on TV and they wanted Jim Carrey to play it. But he wanted too much money. And, and they said, we know, Steve <laughs> Kearney. We know this guy. He actually and looks like, you like that. Same physique. I don't know, I've never met Steve. But so, ah! Look at that! And, uh... That was the, the face. I know, I turned up and did all my... Stuff? Stuff. Your spiel? And, um, I was the only one around that could do it, and, uh, they got me... for $30,000, so... Whoa, that's a bargain price? Bargain price. So was that... that was in LA, or...? LA, yeah. In LA. So, so you filmed a um, feature film in LA yeah. as the lead role. Yes. In the Nutty Nut. Yeah, I played, um, so there was the President of the United States and then he had a brother, twin brother, who was in an asylum. Oh. And I was the nutty nut. Yeah, right. And then the, they, they switch, somehow the President gets taken for me, or the other guy. The other guy. And so I become the President. Uh, did you love it? it? Was, huh? Did you love it? Did you love doing it? It went on for months and months and months. And we went through a couple of directors, and we ended up, I ended up directing a few things. Wow. Nobody was watching, watching the rushes. How does that happen though? It's a, a $10 million dollar film. That's un, oh gosh. People wanted me fired, people, people wanted me hired. Um, See people don't, normal, everyday people do not understand 
all of this stuff that goes on behind mm. all this sort of thing that you can actually not, you know, a director can go and you can have another one and yeah. then no one's watching rushes. That's, yeah, that's crazy, bad. man. Yeah. That's like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, it got, it got pretty crazy. And then at the end, we did this huge pie fight. You know, massive, massive thing. And, um, you know, you have to do close-ups of pies hitting your face. Mm, and mm. Then, when, then when the crew get to throw pies at you and they're throwing them quite hard, you realise... Rude. I don't know. No, <laughs> what am I doing? There was something and you went, nah, I'm over this. I don't want to do it anymore. Uh, I, I don't know. Well... So did you rap and just, like, go, I'm back to Australia... And oh, we wrapped, and the um, the director who was doing it, um, nobody liked the cut, and so the producers gave me the videotapes, and my roommate at the time was, I'll oh, name drop again, Larry Karaszewski, who wrote Edward, Men, Moon, Larry Flint. Uh, Larry Flint, oh, goodness me. Um, All right. OJ Simpson recently, and Homie and other things, and... It, we we were roommates and he said yeah yeah let's let's recut this and uh we recut it over a weekend and gave it to them they said yep you you cut it now steve wow did you get <laughs> did you get that credit as well no. as yeah no okay um i ended up going to i think it was the warner brothers off melrose as the production part and um Two old guys are there sitting, you know, this is reel to reel stuff. And four people out the back with reel to reels. Yeah, and right. they're, like, they, they're, re, they're going to re edit the film with the star of the film directing this. And they're like. <laughs> um, oh my life. But did it get up and going then? Like, did yeah, it... we cut it. And they eventually realised that I wasn't going to do close ups of myself all the time. So we became good friends. We cut it down to it whatever you know 82 minutes whatever could so, instead yep. of 95 or 100 you know yeah yep. it, it makes a lot of difference yeah and uh i got uh, australian film uh, soundtrack on there and um uh in the meantime the rodney king uh, trial was coming up and the trial was just about to end while we were mixing the sound on these big reels of reels and I've got the screen up there, I'm like, oh wow, I'm about to go to Cannes and release it, you mm -hmm. know, show the market and all mm -hmm. this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And Garbo's about to be released down in Melbourne. And you're thinking, this is great, I'm all... I mean, this is good, those reels of reels going, and technicians yeah. doing this, yeah. and um, the uh, acquittal comes for the, for the police on the Rodney King, and then everybody knows this is going to be a riot. And then literally they just get up, leave their desks, reels of tape are going tick 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 Wow. And they go home and they rush home. So what did you do? Take them? What, like what no, can we you all, do? No, we all had to rush home. Oh, so they, li to, they stayed there? No. No, the reels were there just there The reels were there going It was just over. Oh my God. Not finished. And, you know, then we had the riots. Um, oh, Steve. I've got a million stories about that, but uh, in the middle of that, and then the next few days I had to fly home to Garbo to release Garbo, yeah. which was a huge flop. <laughs> and then the, the producers go, well, we're still going to Cannes. We've got some cut. We've got something. Yeah. And the, they fly me to Cannes, and um, because they were... Uh, trying to rush things or because they were German producers, the French didn't want to let their film in. They didn't approve it. See, all these little things happen. All the these film's little not there. things happen. Mm. But they'd, they'd arranged a party on the, um, on the beach, you know, in front of the big hotels. They had $10,000 worth of seafood and a jazz band. Oh gosh. Open bar, this and this. And they said, we're still going to have the party. I said, no one's going to come. Um, and prior to this, like a two hours before, Garbo has its screening, and uh, and so I go to check it out. This is to sell at the market to the world. Mm. And there's one guy in there, and I sit over there, and he sits there. That starts, 
two minutes later he leaves leaving me in the theater alone oh, no. watching this <laughs> that's terrible okay take a breath take a breath it's okay it's okay okay go to the party yeah go to the party go have the that party. seafood eat the seafood there's three german producers and me and a jazz band <laughs> oh jeez. And, and you're um, not writing this about your, you're not writing a book about all these stories that you have no no you need one to day do one that. day you need to do that and i just um just went okay i'm out Oh, I go, yeah, I go to the, I try and eat as many crabs as I can and yeah, drink them in your and pocket. Water. Yeah, and, you know, it's right on the pier, and they wrap the party up because nobody's coming. Ah, why didn't they come to the party? And I'm like, eh, you know. Oh, um, I think I threw up over the pier, and, oh, and after that, I just went, oh, I'm done. Yeah, I'm done. I've had enough. Yeah, in, yeah. Well, I guess that's the thing. But then, I mean, that I mean, that sounds like a terrible thing to happen. But again mm. these you know you have to that's just something that you go through yep. there's up it's the industry it's the biz happens all the time you're the flavor you're not the flavor mm. deals fall through for crazy crazy reasons mm. so you then skip forward you have then um, come up with oddball Mm -hmm. which is one of the best movies I've ever seen. Oh. I love it. It's a it's a beautiful family feel good mm -hmm. movie. Yeah. And Sarah's amazing and the little puppies they're amazing. Mm -hmm. And it's just a really good film. Like there's no one that you would meet that would not like that film. Yeah. And there's a whole story behind that how you and Lulu, you know, met this man yeah who was oh, i'm sorry what was his name um, swampy swampy that's it swampy and so you know so all of you know the things that don't work out mm. you know you still have this amazing colorful colorful jam-packed mm. of action life plus then you've still got your beautiful wife mm. plus your amazing kids plus living in the best country in the world plus you just get this film up and running which you produced and there's a little role there in as well yes. i see you hello mm. steve um so that's all good and then oh, sorry before that it was um oh gosh bad, uh, bad girl there you uh, go bad girl was after bad girl yeah. was after that's yeah. right so so you're now producing and writing mm. and are you loving that like what has, yeah well it's hit a you know COVID came and uh everything shut down and um uh, we've got new rules for feature films, which means we get less money, which evidently makes it harder to make a film. Maybe they thought less was going to make it easier. Anyway, we're figuring decision, that one out. Decision makers, decision makers. Yeah, film's going to be pretty tough in Australia. Mm. So switching to TV, and I've been working with um, uh, the disabled community, writers, comedians. Oh, fantastic. And they've just got a whole whole different a whole different thing and yeah. I, I had this uh, idea in my head for a very long time and I was very afraid to kind of tell anybody it you know I had to go to this this writer disabled writer and go is that okay to do and he goes yes oh that's <laughs> we cool love that. that's cool that's cool and it's really just uh, working trying to do those kind of projects and kind of just give back step back make it disability led just whatever i can do to help uh, so you, you, will you be producing it or are you down as the yeah, creator I'm trying, or? trying to produce those things yeah, yeah. I mean, there's lots of interest um i'm sure we'll get made somehow and that'll be telly that's yeah so t series uh is is the way to go yeah. i think um yeah um, i mean there's a, there seems to be a lot of um because of covid in mm. fact that people aren't filming over over Sue, yeah, because it's so riddled with COVID. Um, so many people are coming here and filming stuff here. Yeah, which and is destroying the local industry. In in Sydney and Queensland and yeah. and Melbourne. Yeah, and but so all the money's going to overseas companies to shoot overseas stories here. Here, and we want to hear. We want to be using, but so there's a plus to that in that they use local crew, crew yeah. but we want the Australian stories yeah. and the Australian writers and the Australian directors and the Australian crews filming here in our beautiful country and Australian content. Uh, that would be good. Yeah. I'm afraid that's not going to happen. Look, I had the pleasure of working on a couple of um, 
projects which are, were written by Ryan Chamley, mm. and he's a Geelong based director and writer, and he's amazing. And I think, I, I, I remember looking around, I mean, I was um, doing costume and art department and what have you, but I remember looking around and just, and, and looking at his second script in particular, which is um, a pilot which is about to come out called My Friend Anxiety, mm. and reading that script and going, shit you're clever yeah shit you are so clever we this is and 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 then looking around on set and watching everybody work and mm. and watching it sort of just go from there up to there mm. and any minute now being you know up there and it makes me feel really proud and i i love watching australian anything mm. you know i love i love listening to our accents when i say our because part kiwi but you know um but I love listening to, I love looking at the take, the, the specific way Australians look at the world. Yeah. You know, it's really quite different from an American point of view. Or, yeah. And if know. you don't have the creatives in control, we're not going to get that. Um, That's right. You know, Oddball wouldn't be made today. Oh, and that would have been a crying shame if it did yeah. not. I mean, I, could, I wouldn't have made beautiful. it without government support, mm. um, government help you know guidance all the people in the funding bodies mm. um you know because eventually i mean it took me five years six years to get up yeah see that's another thing so people think oh i'm just going to make an, a, a feature film and it'll just be real quick yeah. but it's not it's it's a it's a massively no. long process nobody isn't wanted it? it for four or five years wow that's amazing to think and that it comes back to you, producer. Well, get a script that works. You know, get something going. You mm, know, mm. and uh, but someone told me once um, that you can have the best idea, and it can be the funniest, the saddest, the mm. most amazing. But if nobody wants to fund it, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, you're stuffed, really, aren't you? Unless you can self like find the money yourself, or you you're a bisquillionaire and you go, I'm just going to make it anyway and get it out there. Mm. But, you know, it goes in cycles because when Oddball was out, we needed that in... Perfect you know, timing. Perfect timing. It just really hit a good, good yeah, spot. Yeah, we had, we had um, Paper Planes. Yeah, was a big Paper success Planes. that year. It was a good year for Australian film and we we came in at the end of it in September. Mm. And, um, perfect. We just really... I mean, Australia's just had a great run as well. Yeah, yeah. The dry and... Penguin Bloom and yes, all sorts yes, of things, but yes, they yes. were made two years ago. Yeah, this is it because people think it's you know I keep saying people think I'm mm. talking about me, normal people in the community that yeah. that you know don't aren't involved in those sorts of things all the time. They do take an awful long time. So yeah. what we're seeing now is an idea way 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 back then, and yeah. probably even before it was filmed two years ago, it was being thought about five years before that, or seven oh, yeah. or ten or Could be. whatever. Um, and so, you know, all well, that's exci that's exciting. That's exciting to see that you you are not just going to be surfing <laughs> and <laughs> tap dancing. That you're actually. I'd rather be just surfing. Oh, come on! You love it. You'll never not do this sort of thing mm. because there's the chase. There's the the detail of it. There's the connecting people. Yeah. There, there's it, looking at the stories and wanting to create yeah, and trying to crack those stories. Um, mm. You know, with, with, with Oddball, it was an uh, old guy has a weird idea, puts dog on island, waits. Okay, mm. let's make a movie about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, the, way, the, the how I've heard of that story is I was down in Warrnambool and um, there's these storytellers who, who are um, trammies. I'm not sure what they go around now. And you, you get a tram ticket. And on the ticket is a local story of fauna and flora. And they localise it. And my story was about Oddball. And I went, that's a movie. Ah, oh, see? Ding! Light bulb. And then I tracked down Swampy. And I went to his house and his dogs are like huge. You know, oh. he, he didn't have one. He had like ten. They're Marama, Maremas, aren't they? yeah. Maremas. Mm. Very dangerous dogs. Yeah, well, they protect penguins. Yeah. And then I'm talking to him, and he talks for three hours. I'm like, oh, my God, this guy is gold. So, you know, I know I've got to, I'm hooked. 
and, and it doesn't matter what anyone says, I know it's going to be huge. Yeah, you could feel it. And I just knew that and knew, you know, you'd go to Khan and you give people the script and they just go like this, mm, feels like four million dollars. I'm like, <gasps> oh, so that really does happen. Oh, it happens. Mm. It absolutely absolutely happens. It happens. I've it been watching happen. The Crown lately, so I've just tried to do my own. Mm. Oh, man, um, I love The Crown. Mm. Catching up, as you do. Uh, yeah, so it's it, once you get hooked with a story and you know it's great and everyone says it isn't, then you're like, huh. I know. Aha. Yeah. Aha. Yeah. I know. You don't know. Yeah. That's even better. That's even better, yeah. Because it's a surprise. Sure. Of course, when it's coalesces and it's out there and you say, and this is before it's made, but but in the business everyone knows it's it's the hot property, and then they go, oh yeah, that's great, you know. But, you know, you but the month before, no one wants to know. Yeah, exactly. But what a fickle business. It's a fickle you know, business. It is a fickle business, but it's a beautiful business. And look, well, I can't do anything. I tried other things. I tried other things, um, digital stuff, and and I was sitting at a meeting with people, and they were talking about, and I realised, oh, they're just doing it for the money. I'd never, I'd never even thought about it. Yeah, but that's, that happens a lot, that they're, it's not about the idea or the creative mm. or making a story or bringing that story to life or telling someone's story. Mm. It doesn't often come, it does often come down to that, just about the money and I think that's when well, you that's know. that's a real job, yeah. Yeah, that's a real job. That's not this business. No. And that's why a lot of musicians and actors and you know people that yeah. really love what they do like even you know working on low budget whatever is you yeah. do it because you love it and you yeah. want to can bring that to life and yeah well that's you know, what happened with Bagwell you know I was on Dolly and second second unit mm. and catering and sweeping and yes 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 the hauling lights and whatever it took yeah, it was yeah. like going back to film school but um, made a nice little film yeah beautiful um, and yeah you'd like the opportunity to do it again but you know knowing that this took my whole life to make oddball mm. because of all the mistakes you make before in in screenwriting in scripting producing casting you say this time we're going to do it right and i wanted that disney feel mm. and um you know we had some we had a lot of help and peter ivan did a great job writing and all that sort of stuff so it was amazing uh i was pretty happy with it we should be. I thought it'd, I thought it'd be much, much bigger, much, much bigger. But that was my job. There it is. Cheerleader. Mm. Well, thank you very much for coming in and having a chat thank you. on how fabulous. There is so much more that I would actually like to ask you. So perhaps you will come back mm. and we could talk about my TV sitcom deals in America. Well, we that's done that. th th well. There mm. we go. Those we haven't even gone there. We'll do a whole thing on sitcoms. Let's do that then. Actually, because that's just one thing before we go. I will say, I did read that you had a guest role on Friends, even. Yes. It was on the other night. What? I need to look at it. Do you have a friend? Do you freeze frame it and go, yeah, that's me. I'm on Friends. No. No. I don't watch it. Yeah. There's that. No. But anyway, we will. We'll have you back again if you will come. Mm -hmm. And we can chat more about so many other things. Wow. Thank you. Gracias. Gracias. Namaste.